Hello, guys and gals, and this is part 12 of our reading of Pandora's Jeans. Um, as always, we're going to go over the um, copyright information. This is an original copy from 1985. It is a book by Catherine Lance and copyright to Catherine Lance. All rights reserved, but I have the, uh, the author's written permission to read this book on my channel. And um, in the last one, in the last part... Um, the principal arrived at the um, garden, and he wants to move all the women closer to the capital. And he wants to take Evie against her will, probably. And he is at a the council meeting, where they are trying to discuss whether they should actually move because of all the outlaw problems and the barbarians that are out and about. And we're going to see what happens. Okay, um... It was foregone from the beginning that he would win, one way or, or the other, and the principal sat silent, only answering questions, trying not to show his growing impatience. If there was only some way for men to reproduce without the help of women, he'd be more than happy to see the whole lot of them die out. At last the vote was taken, and inevitably it was in favor of leaving quietly without a fight. Throughout the tally, Katha sat silent, her grim face reflecting what she must be feeling. The council members were all elders, adults, adult and middle-aged, though none, though none so old as the mistress. He had hoped for another glimpse of the girl, Evie, but had not really expected to see her here. The faces were sad, some, some tear-streaked, when the meeting broke up, and he felt awkward as he prepared to leave. Katha rose as he did, and he thought for a moment she would offer her, her hand, but she stood stiffly, while he walked to the door. For the first time, he saw that her bandaged arm was badly hurt and must be paining her. "'We can give you an escort to your camp,' said the, the fat woman, Gunda. "'I know these woods well,' he answered. His sense of triumph was physical. He could feel it, expanding in his abdomen and chest like warm air. He ran care carelessly down the slope." the sloping trail, feeling almost as if he could fly. At last he had achieved his greatest conquest. From the time, from this time on, the women of the garden and their work w were under his rule absolutely. The next morning the principal gathered his troops and told them about the, inhabit the inhabitants of the garden. First the men were astonished and then excited at the prospect of guarding a compound full of women, but the principal made it clear immediately that any man caught molesting any of the women would be executed at once. The evacuation would take some time. Those soldiers who were to man the fortress would begin moving in as they helped the women to dismantle and load the many things which would be carried by the caravan of large wagons due to arrive from the capital within a week. The women themselves were to carefully pack and hide all microscopes, books, and other equipment which would be identify which would identify their work as scientists. The mistress and Katha had both insisted that all men, including the principal, be outside the compound by nightfall. They took care, too, to keep the younger girls strictly hidden from the soldiers. He had expected that, but even when he was busy with details, a part of him was excited by the thought that uh, that the astonishing young girl was nearby, perhaps looking at him secretly, as she had that night in the lodge. It was difficult not to be impatient, but there would be time to think of how to take her after the evacuation was completed. In any case, he would be very busy. While Red supervised the physical details of the move, the principal directed the contingent of men in creating detailed maps of the entire surrounding countryside up to and including the western border. This was not a formal border in any political sense, as was the border which separated the holdings from those of the governor of the north. Rather, it represented the extent of the area the principal loosely controlled through patrols, taxation, and communication posts. Now that he had the garden, he could consolidate this part of the district and began to move to the west, crushing, as he did, the traders 
or any other tribe opposing the growth of his civilization. The principal had been in camp a week. He was completing the draft of a lengthy com communique with Ralph back at the the capital explaining what had happened so far and giving instructions for further recruitment of troops when Daniel and an older grizzled soldier appeared at the opening of the tent. Pardon, sir, said Daniel. Buck has found something. I thought you should hear his report immediately. The principal suppressed his annoyance. If, if it could wait, whatever it was, Daniel would not have interrupted. Settling, oh, setting down his pen, he turned to the two men. Report. I was with a party of six, said Buck, shifting from foot to foot. We were doing what you instructed, mapping, looking for signs of trader camps. We worked our way south along the lake into the swamps, he stopped. And then, as the principal nodded impatiently, went on slowly. There is a deserted part of the world, as you know, sir. We hadn't found when I came into a big pile of bones buried half in the muck. The... the principal frowned. Where were there signs that these were the remains of, of traitors? Daniel stepped forward. Buck asked me to come out in accordance with your instruction to investigate everything. We pulled the bones out of the swamp. It looked, it took a good while. When we were through, we saw that the skeleton had once belonged to a very large man and a mount. The principal, sudden, the principal felt suddenly cold. There are many large men in the district, he said. That's true, sir, said Daniel, but only one of them wore this ring. Daniel opened his hand and gave the principal a heavy golden ring. On, it, on its raised face was, the car, was carved the profile of the principal. There was not another ring like it in the world. I'm sorry, said Daniel. The principal nodded. He looked dumbly at the ring, which was still warm from Daniel's hand. Was there any indication of how he died? The bones are old, said Daniel. But I say at least the ribs, at least the ribs are broken. But by an uh, but an animal could have done that after he died. We searched the area closely, but there was nothing else. Of course, loose weapons could have been taken. By anyone, he paused and went on. We left the other men to guard the bones. We thought you'd want to give them a proper burial. Thank you, said the principal. Both of you. Give me a minute. We'll do it now. Looking distressed and embarrassed, the men stepped outside. The principal looked after them a moment, then down at the ring. There could be no doubt now that Zack was dead. The certainty of it did not seem to shock, seem as shocking as had the first news of Zack that Zack was missing. Perhaps he had already given Zack up those many months ago, and his mourning was was and his mourn his mourning was complete. In his place was ang was anger, <sighs> hard and tight and hot. Whatever had been responsible for Zack's death, and it seemed likely now it must have been the traitors, would pay a thousand times over. He opened his hand and looked at the ring again, then put it inside his personal pouch. Straightening, he stood up and left for the burial. Chapter 9 From the first night the principal arrived, Evie had a picture of him always in her mind. Of course, she, he, of course he could have no way of knowing who she was or what she had done, but she couldn't shake the eerie feeling that he somehow knew her. For days she had been studying him in secret, from behind corners, through breaches in the wall, past shutters and curtains. His face fascinated her. He was so handsome as to be almost beautiful, yet there was a harsh determined there were there were harsh determined lines in his cheeks and above his eyes. The irises of his eyes were so dark that they appeared to be all pupil. Once the first night he came, those eyes had laid, had met hers, and she had felt pinned like an insect, unable to move, until he had looked away. His eyes retained their intensity, whether he was giving orders, laughing, or shouting in anger, all of which he did frequently, shifting from one mood to another easily and quickly. She had a, a feeling his face was a mask, something he put on, like 
the yellow trimmed cape he wore to set himself apart from his men. Evie longed to ask the mistress more about him. She was aware that there was some tie between them that and had heard rumors that the principal himself had lived in the garden as a boy. It must have been here, in fact, that he and Zack had become friends, yet she was afraid to speak of him as if mentioning his name would give him her secrets. The truth was that whether Evie saw the principal or thought of him, she thought of Zack. Zack had been the principal's most trusted advisor and friend, and had betrayed him because of her. The question was why. Kathleen Gunda assumed that Zack had taken her because he wanted her for himself, but she knew that was not true, at least not in the sense they meant. Her feelings had been confirmed by the thing the mistress had told her about Zack's wife and child. Perhaps someday she might have been able to persuade Zack to renounce his vow. Now, of course, it was too late. Even, even if he returned for her, she was a daughter of the garden, and though, though some daughters of the garden and even left the garden and even married, it was only with the full approval of all the elder women, women and never to a man whose wife had died of the woman's sickness. Though she still believed that Zack was alive somewhere, he was lost to her, and all she could do now was to protect his memory by seeing that it was the prince that the principal never learned who she was or that Z- or what Zack had done. The mistress, Katha, and Gunda were the only women who knew Evie's true origin, and she was certain that they would never reveal it. The day before the march was to begin, the principal invited all the women to attend a feast prepared by his men. To Evie's surprise, the mistress accepted for the garden. Having fi- furnished some last-minute packing of equipment in the animal pens, Evie went to the women's wing to get her bathing things. She found Lucky there, sobbing into her pillow. Katha, Katha struck me, the younger girl said. There was a faint red mark on the side of her face. Evie put her arms around Lucky and gave her a moment. Gave her a moment. She had noticed Katha's growing ir- irritability. What happened, she asked. I don't know. I was loading a wagon with Jimmy. I, don't, I didn't even know Katha was there. All I said was, I was glad that we wouldn't have to stand that I... I was glad we wouldn't have to stand guard anymore, and Katha grabbed me and slapped me on the face. Evie patted Lucky's shoulder. The move is hard for her, she said. I'm sure she didn't mean to hurt you. Lucky wiped her eyes and rolled over on her back. Evie, she asked after a moment, are you going to the principal's party tonight? Of course, said Evie. Why not? I don't know, said Lucky. I heard Katha saying we, we shouldn't go, that it's a trick. I'm afraid, but I want to see what it's like. There's nothing to be afraid of, said Evie. We'll go together, and if we don't like it, we can leave. Lucky smiled assent, her recent tears completely forgotten. Evie herself was not as calm as she appeared. She felt pulled in two directions. Part of her was consumed with curiosity about the principal and his men, while another part was terrified at the thought of spending an evening in his company. The fact that all of the women had been invited and her curiosity won the battle. At last she would be able to observe him closely, safely, anonymous among the other women. The garden is a a state of mind as such as it is a location, the principal was saying. It is a place where ideas can live, of all things, in our society. More than buildings, more than laws, more than individual men and women, ideas determine our lives. Most of the garden's women and children were watching and listening attentively. Evie wrapped a thick new wool shawl, oh, sat between the mistress and Lucky in front of them. Baby lay curled, buzzing in contentment. On the other side of the large bonfire sat the soldiers. Most were bearded like her first and second fathers. A few others were clean-faced like the principal. All were silent and motionless, their eyes fixed on their leader, the firelight blinking shad- blink shadows on their face, oh, on his face as he talked, and was reflected back by his dark eyes. Evie squeezed the lucky's hand, thrilled. 
The garden has been here for two generations, ever since the, the change, he went on. It was started by a small group of, of learned men and women, by teachers and thinkers, who knew that disasters like the escape of the wild dinas could never happen again because the change itself had made such accidents impossible. But they also knew that comfort, freedom from disease and poverty, many of the good things from before the change, could perhaps one day be restored. These brave men and women determined to preserve as much as they could of the learning of the past so that someday the learning can be used again to help mankind. The people of the garden have devoted their lives all these years to saving and trying to increase knowledge so that someday life will be more as it was here, was here, was before the change. He paused, and Evie heard a murmuring of voices. The principal's men were whispering among themselves, some glancing at him with frowns. She heard one gruff voice say lowly, Sounds like science to me, but the man was immediately silenced by his companions. The women were quiet, many of them looking surprised. The mistress sat with her eyes closed, but Evie knew she was listening. The principal went on with a short history of how the compound had grown from a very few huts to a large town-like fortress it was today, how the inhabitants had given as much time and thought to self-sufficiency as they had to learning from the beginning. They saw that the change caused much misery because people had grown soft and ignorant, unable to care for themselves, so they began training children from an early age to do as much for themselves as possible and to learn everything they could about the world. The first part of the, that philosophy, the need for self-sufficiency, had already spread through the district and helped to make our stability possible. The second, the vital importance of understanding the world, I hope to spread. From the first day when I became the, a leader of men, I vowed that I would help to bring back civilization Civilization is much more than law and order and comfort. It is also learning and creating new ideas and art. The garden is the seed of our new civilization, and it will continue to grow in its new home. He paused again, and this time his audience remained silent, watching as he paced a few steps. Then, with one hand raised, he concluded, when it began, the garden was made up of both men and women. Times and customs change, but I hope that soon both men and women can again work together for civilization. The last part of the speech was de delivered with such passion and conviction that Evie found tears starting to, starting to her eyes. She realized that the principal could not have achieved his power if he were not skilled at making speeches. Still, she was touched, it seemed. Still, she was touched. It seemed obvi obvious he had given this, this, this speech not only at his explanation to his men, but as a tribute to the women of the garden. It, if he felt this, this way about the garden and his, object, his objectives, what could the source of enmity between him and the garden oh, what could be the source of the enmity between him and the garden leaders? There was silence when he finished speaking, then again murmuring from both sides of the fire. Some of the men were looking suspicious at him, while the others nodded or gazed at the women across the fire with narrowed eyes. The silence grew, and with it the sense of tension. Then Evie felt a movement at her side. The mistress sat up straight and began to clap. Immediately the other women joined her, and the applause spread across to where the men sat. After a moment, some of them stood and began cheering. The principal smiled, almost slyly, and sat. Evie was sure she could see relief on his face. He, he accepted a cup of brew from one of his men, and then glanced toward the mistress and nodded. At a signal, the men who had prepared the feast began to set, set out dishes and pitchers. The conversation started and grew to a, con, a constant buzz. He seems to care about us, Lucky said, the firelight illuminating her freckled face. Do you think he meant it? I'm sure of it, said Evie, still moved. The old woman turned her head. It's a struggle in him, she said. There are still many things he doesn't understand and never will. Evie was about to ask more when Baby did an astonishing thing. The little fox cat had kept her ears pricked and given 
every evidence of paying attention to the speech. Now she suddenly got to her feet, stretched and trotted around the fire, straight to the principal. He was speaking and laughing with one of his aides, his teeth flashing white. As Evie watched, the fox cat sat on her haunches directly in front of the principal, waiting to be noticed. After a moment, she gently touched his knee with a paw. Still, the principal did not react until the man he was speaking to laughed and pointed to the fox cat. Evie could not hear what the man said, but the principal looked surprised, speaking clearly and loudly. Well, hi, hello there, he said. He put out a hand and scratched the fox cat between between the ears. Baby stretched herself in the in the pleasure of being touched and tickled by hand. Evie nudged the mistress. Look, he whispered. Baby liked the speech, too. The old woman gazed across the fire and nodded. I have learned to trust Baby's judgment, she said. One of the women handed her a bowl of stew, and she turned to eat it without further comment. Evie ate her own dinner and watched as the fox cat curled up beside the principal, who continued to talk, his hand lightly resting on the little animal's flank. Evie felt far more relaxed he here than she could have imagined. She scarcely listened while Lucky kept up an excited stream of chatter next to her. I never saw so many men, said Lucky. They weren't so scary up close, are they? Oh, they aren't so scary up close, are they? The, the man sitting next to the principal looked kind, don't you think? She giggled. Then, when Evie didn't answer, she went on. What do you think of the principal, Evie? Evie turned to her and, and start her startled. I don't know, she said. She thought up. She thought of the few things that Zack had said about him and remembered her, her terror that night he had first come. She asked. Oh, she also thought of his easy smile and the way his men looked at him and followed him. I think he must be a good, a very good leader, she said at last. He's awfully handsome, Lucky went on. He looks like a picture of one of, in one of the mistress's books, Katha says. He's evil and cruel. He doesn't seem that way tonight, though. The feasting continued and for some time, and Evie began to grow sleepy. Lucky, too, settled down and occasional, settled down and occasional comment the only sign that she was awake. Some of the soldiers had begun to sing an old an old products ballad and were soon joined by the women sitting not far from Evie. Katha hissed at, at her to stop, but at almost the same time, another high voice, and then another joined in, and soon as many women were singing as men. It sounded wonderful to Evie, who had heard very little music in her life except on the journey with Zach. Those who were not singing were talking and laughing loudly, men and women together, and Evie suddenly realized, startled, that many of them were drunk. Never before had she seen anyone drunk act happy. Her second father drunk from time to time, and always became morose, and sometimes men shouting and threatening to beat his wife and his children, although he never did. This is disgusting, Katha said loudly. Can I be the only one who sees what he's trying to do? The mistress, who had seemed to be doing, dozing, opened her eyes. Katha, please, don't you know yet that it's not even, that it's not men who are our enemy? Katha seemed about to retort, but Gunda placed a gentle arm around her shoulder. She leapt. She, oh, she leaned over and whispered something in her ear. Katha shook her head angrily and didn't speak. The old woman's eyes closed again, and this time she truly did seem to be asleep. After a few minutes, she slumped against the, the tree. At almost the same moment, Lucky yawned loudly and called to Katha and gestured to the old woman. Katha rose. It's time for bed, she said in a commanding tone. We have a long day tomorrow, and it's late. Several women nodded and yawned, and... Others continued to sing and talk. Katha clapped her hands for attention, but before she could speak again, the principal looked up. Those who wish stay just a little longer, he said, smiling. It's bad luck to break up a party too early. Superstitious fool, Katha, uh, Katha muttered with a poisoned, poisonous look at the principal. She knelt and, with Gunda's help, gently brought the mistress to her feet. The old woman seemed still asleep. She had drunk a glass of brew, Evie remembered. Are you coming, Evie? 
asked Lucky, her eyebrows, her eyelids heavy. Evie considered it was probably best to go now, but she was enjoying the singing, and besides, Baby was not with her. She had become accustomed to going to sleep with the little fox cat, although Baby generally left her late at night to hunt. In a few minutes, she said, she glanced across the fire where Baby was playing tug-of-war with another, with one of the principal's men. Lucky nodded. Good night, then, she said, and joined the other women and children who were walking through the gate and into the compound. There were more than a dozen women still present, and perhaps four times as many men. Feeling quite grown up, Evie settled herself a little closer to the fire and yawned. She would wait just till Katha returned. A hand was shaking her shoulder, a gently voice speaking. Has our singing put you to sleep? Evie looked up to see the principal's smiling face a few inches above her own. He was kneeling between her and the fire. She had fallen asleep against the tree. Oh, she said, unable to think of any response. I believe this is your fox cat, he said. Sleepily and shyly, Evie nodded. Um, baby rubbed against her, then abruptly turned and jumped at a large insect drawn to the fire. Baby, she cried and half rose, but the principal blocked her way. Let her play for a few more minutes, he said. You're not in such a hurry, are you? She wanted nothing more than to stay and talk to him, but again could think of nothing to say. What's your name, he asked. She told him, stammering, Evie, I'd like you to have a cup of brew with us. We've been enjoying your pet and would like to thank you. This is going badly. His breath smelled of brew and new smoke, but it was not unpleasant and reminded her of Zack. Thank you, she said. I don't think I should. For luck, he said. Daniel, bring a cup of brew for my friend Evie. His aide crossed around the woman's side of the fire. He was a young, clean-shaven man with light brown hair, and Evie thought he was, near, he was nearly as handsome as the principal. He moved unsteadily, but was smiling. Perhaps Evie decided the way people responded to drink depended on the circumstances. She accepted the cup, too shy even to say thank you, and sipped and spit it out. It was horribly bitter. The principal and his friends laughed. A bit strong, said the principal, but you'll soon get used to it. You must never sip brew, but drink it down like this. Drinking his own cup, he demonstrated and held it out to be refilled from a large flask, the large flask Daniel carried. Let's stop it here. We've got to page 133. That's pretty good. Anyways, we have been reading from Pandora's Jeans. It is a book by Catherine Lance. And if you want your own copy of this book or the next book of the, of the trilogy, Pandora's Children, or the third book of the trilogy, Pandora's Promise, then most of the big book retailers should have it. Anyways, if you like this content, then make sure you like and subscribe, ring the bell so you know when I upload. Also, if you want to support me in any way, all that information will be in the description below. As always, thanks for watching, everyone, and have a great day.